Um, so this is the music archiving and museum in Kimmel. I'm the watch here, Amy Joseph um, from National Library. Uh, also from National Library, we have shot what we've done in the front here. Uh, a couple of familiar faces to people who were here yesterday were John Peck from Upper Park and Simon Pendle uh, from Simon Pendle digitizing <laughs> and we'll be cooking things off with uh, Simon Drake audio culture, so um, the structure is going to be, they're going to give you a bit of a feel on the particular areas of interest in the publications and so forth to start with, and then it will get a bit more panel discussion uh, And I would encourage anyone in the audience who's involved in music and music culture archiving to feel free to speak up in that panel discussion. Really, we don't represent the entire spectrum of what's going on in the country, so, um, and internationally. Uh, so, um, that will be quite a participatory sort of a session. Uh, and also just a quick heads up, I believe that uh, this is going to be potentially uh, used for a wee segment in Radio New Zealand's Music 101, uh, hopefully this weekend. Um, so if you're asking questions potentially, but not especially likely, you might end up on that. And without further ado, we get Simon number one to take the Hi there. Yeah, I'm Simon Gregg. I'm the creative director uh, and founder of Audio Culture, which is the noisy library of New Zealand music. Um, anybody that's seen the site will recognise that page. That's our front page. It's a uh, ever scrolling page with some 550 items on it so far. Um, we've, it's called the noisy library of New Zealand music. We sat around for a few hours trying to work out exactly what we were when we first started looking at the site. And that seemed to be the best description. Russell Brown actually came up with the tag, so we stuck with it. We are a library. But the thing that isn't said there is we're, we're kind of telling the stories of New Zealand music, and that's the underlying philosophy of the site. Um, we want to go out and, and capture stuff which has existed but hasn't been recorded, or um, has been recorded and the recording has disappeared, or bring it all together in one place and adding context to the whole story of New Zealand music. We're... Um, almost completely funded by New Zealand On Air, and we're in partnership with New Zealand On Screen. We're slightly funded as of recently by Recorded Music New Zealand. Um, and we launched with 250 pages. We had 20 pages a month to the site, uh, broken down between what we call people pages, which is uh, the human resources, if you will, of the site, uh, scenes, which is a very loose sort of thing that captures everything from venues to to scenes, to um, recording studios, to all sorts of stuff. Um, and record labels. We went out there and we decided to capture every New Zealand record label that had ever existed, that it released. We, we said five um, releases, but we're fairly loose on that. And we're about to expand, I think, into the multinational record labels as well, because the multinationals are kind of important in New Zealand. Um, the site itself is designed, the art directed by a guy called Phil Kelly, who's a, a print designer rather than a web designer. And I sat down with him, we, we worked out what we were trying to do, we were trying to get a fanzine sort of look to audio culture. So that's why you have the, the very plain colours, the blocky sort of stuff, and it's more, I suppose for want of a better phrase, it's kind of rock and roll, and it wasn't supposed to be too complicated, and heavily visual. Um, the it had to be identifiably New Zealand, even though it doesn't say audio culture NZ. We kind of tossed around little bits and pieces to try and get the NZ in there. It has that New Zealand map in the background, and it is identifiably New Zealand, we think. It's also, and we're kind of proud of this, it's, we think it's the world first. We don't think anywhere else in the world anyone's tried to do this. And uh, we can do it in New Zealand because we are a small country, and our music industry is, while it's prolific at the moment, it wasn't always so. So, I mean, you couldn't do it in Australia, for example, which is a much bigger country, or the United States, or, you know, because their industries are so much bigger and they go further back. So the question we are asked time and time again when we first started looking at audio culture two or three years ago was why. And for people in the music industry, they understand the, the why. We, we all know that it was instinctive. But for a lot of other people, especially some of our funders and things, the why question was something that... Um, we had to explain. 
And as much as anything, I think this picture kind of explains it. Now that picture is Johnny Devlin. We don't know where, we don't know who took it. And it's in a theater somewhere in New Zealand in 1959. That picture had never been published before until uh, what, maybe seven or eight months ago. We found it in someone's scrapbook, uh, Johnny Devlin's scrapbook actually. And yeah, we don't know where it came from. He doesn't know where it came from. But New Zealanders all know about Elvis. You can, you can mention, ask a room full of New Zealanders over a certain age, who was Elvis Presley? And they'll know. Johnny Devlin, you sit in the room with people and ask them who Johnny Devlin was, and 80% of them won't know who Johnny Devlin was. So we want to change that. That's, those are New Zealanders sitting in, a, in an audience looking at a singer who was as big as, Johnny, as Elvis Presley in New Zealand at the time which is the digital silences thing we're looking at. There was so much New Zealand stuff which isn't online musically, and we needed to capture that stuff. A lot of early um, 2000s and late 1990s bands came onto the internet, disappeared, they broke up, GeoCities was their site or whatever, and disappeared. So there's a huge gap out there. You go and try and find a band like Stella who sold tens of thousands of records in New Zealand, and they don't have a website. So we're, we're trying to sort of rectify that. Analog silences, well that's kind of about the fact that there's some great books being written and some, some great journals about New Zealand music, but they tend to be in the basement of libraries around the country and unless you actually want to go and hunt them out, most books are out of print. Um, so we want to try and drag all that stuff online and say here it is. And we also figured out that if we, the music community, and my history is in the music industry for more years than I care to remember, uh, if we don't do it ourselves, then no one's going to do it for us, so we had to go out there and do it. We defined popular music as 1926 onwards because the first recordings were made in New Zealand that year, or just in 1927, but we 26, 27 was the, the, the line. And we, we're popular music rather than classical music because there is a sound site which covers classical music. So our definition of popular music is kind of everything apart from classical. And there are obviously lines which are very grey in between to music concrete and you know, a lot of things from scratch, that sort of stuff. Um, we're designed to inform, excite and entertain. It's got to be accessible and it's got to be entertaining for younger people as well who are brought up in a digital world. We don't want to be a dry sort of archive, basically, just throwing things out there and saying this is documenting it without making it interesting. So to do that, we've... Um, both curated it and we've also brought a lot of stuff on board as well to make the pages more interesting. So you've got um, New Zealand on screen Im embeds, YouTube embeds, um, SoundCloud, Spotify, Radio New Zealand embeds, all these sort of things to make it work. And the Spotify allows, as we go ahead, allows you to listen to just about every New Zealand record that's ever been released because Recorded Music New Zealand are trying to get them all online. So there's no point in going to a page about an artist if you can't listen to their music. That's what we're all about, it is about the music. Uh, context, we're a small country, everything fits together, it all locks together. So that's, when we first went to New Zealand on air and tried to get funding, we used this diagram here. <laughs> now, right in the middle of that, where the arrow points to, is the dance exponents. Now, m most people know who the dance exponents or the exponents are, Jordan Luck, etc. So we started there and we drew out and we said everything that's related. And that took us about probably half an hour to draw that, in that little box those boxes of things that came out, and we realised that we could have gone on for days, it would have gone through, and probably it would have touched most people in the New Zealand music industry at some stage, who were, because it went right back, I mean we had, it went to Mike Chan, who was involved with Eldred Stebbing, which takes you to Zodiac Records, which takes you to the Lardy Dars, you know, it's, it's, it's incredibly complicated, but everything is related in New Zealand, it's a big ball of string. So everything's related to Jordan Luck. <laughs> 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 Uh, those, these are the relationships, and we thought it was very important to bring up relationships and to establish relationships with a lot of bodies in New Zealand. And these, were, these are the key relationships we currently have, and we have more sort of peripheral ones, but the, several of these are formalised. Um, Radio New Zealand, we have a good relationship with Radio New Zealand, whereby we embed and we supply them with images, and it's, it's a mutual relationship. National Library, we have a fantastic relationship with National Library and Alexander Turnbull and they supply us with images and we work with them and we're trying to acquire things for, for the National Library and Alexander Turnbull, for collections and that sort of thing. 
Uh, regional libraries, we don't have any formal relationships with regional libraries, but we have informal relationships, so that works very, very well. Um, APRA and Recorded Music New Zealand, they're both the, the major industry bodies, if you will. APRA represents the songwriters, and Recorded Music New Zealand represents the record labels, and we have formal relationships with both of those two. The record labels themselves, we deal with them all the time. We're, I talk to people like Flying Nun, probably daily, and they supply us with stuff, and we supply them the current Flying Nun reissues that are happening. We're supplying all the photographs and things that are going inside of that. So, and that's the wider music community too, and that's very informal, but it's, we deal with musicians and fans all the time. You know, the amount of stuff that comes to us is extraordinary. And we're also able to supply things to people, people who, like your uncle may have died and he was in a band and there's no family photographs. So we actively do that sort of thing. We, we want to be part of the community. Which takes us to where we're going. Now we're talking to uh, New Zealand Micrographic Society, NZMS, about their, <laughs> about their Recollect software right now, which is uh, a way of advancing our idea that a profile or a page in audio culture is never finished. We want to go out into the community, to uh, the small towns, to the big cities, all throughout the country and say to people, give us your stuff, because there's so much stuff sitting in garages, sitting in boxes, uh, and it, it's all part of the story. We are a community. Audio culture is a part of New Zealand's wider music community, and it has to reflect. <laughs> So with that in mind, and I've been wound up here right now, with, with that in mind, we're going to go hopefully next year, take it on the road and go from town to town and through the country and sort of stand up and say, we're here, give us your stuff. And Record Collect is an incredibly powerful piece of software which allows us to absorb that into audio culture. So that's us. Uh, my name's Simon. Uh, you may have seen my talk yesterday uh, about my digitisation of Rip It Up. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick idea, uh, an overview of what's come out of that. Um, there's been a few more things I've been working on uh, as a result. Uh, and then take a look at some issues I see around memory institutions and digitisation and preservation, which um, some of you may be interested in. Um, I'm not going to talk about audio culture. I'm bloody glad it's there, and thank you for all your <laughs> hard work in putting it together. Uh, and I'll leave it to Sholto to talk about dealing with the born digital stuff. Generally, I'm going to just have a chat about analog things. So out of my rip it up digitization story, strangely enough, um, when you get a rich source of primary content, um, stories start to emerge. And so I'm currently telling three stories based on the work that I've done. So, and the stories, these are, are of three of New Zealand's independent record labels, Ripper Records, Simon's Propeller, and Flying Nun. Ooh. I turned it around the right way, it might work properly. There we go. Um, so Ripper Records was one of the first New Zealand post-punk independent record labels, started by Auckland radio DJ Brian Staff. Brian ran a popular nighttime alternative show on 1ZM at the time, in which he also played and recorded demos of local bands, especially those coming out of the thriving punk scene. In 1979, he decided to commit some of these demos to vinyl before they were lost forever. The answer was the brilliant compilation AK-79, which was the birth of Ripper Records. It lasted till 1983 and left an eclectic bunch of records behind, including the Swingers smash hit Counting the Beat and a John Lennon cover by current sitting National Party MP Marilyn Waring. Propeller started life in Auckland in 1980, established by my erstwhile co-panellist, Simon, uh, to release a single by The Features. It managed to release the first New Zealand song to debut at number one with the Screaming Mimi's July classic, uh, July 1981 classic, See Me Go. It's also released along with a slew of others. It was Blam Blam Blam's classic, There Is No Depression in New Zealand, which became somewhat of an anthem to the anti-tour protesters during the Springbok tour in 1981. Flying Nun probably needs no introduction, really. It's currently enjoying a critical and public renaissance, uh, aided by their nice re-release program in association with US record label Capt Captured Tracks. 
It also started in 1981. Its first release was Ambivalence by the Pin Group, which is eminently collectible. Screen art by Ronnie Van Hout. Uh, fly, they also released a large number of iconic New Zealand bands, The Clean, The Villains, The Chills, Straight Jacket Fits, to name a few, but you probably know that uh, already. So much like my Rip It Up project, these three use a combination of Tumblr and Twitter, but I've also added Facebook pages for all these stories, which has added an interesting dynamic. So here's some stats. There's nothing much you can specifically glean out of any of these. They're here really as a, a point of interest. Um, Flying Nun one was, I started first. That has more Tumblr followers, but Ripper has the most Facebook likes, and I haven't dug into any of this because it doesn't really concern me. So it's not being done for the hits. Um, I'm doing it as I think these are stories that need to be told, uh, and I don't want them to be lost. So Flying Nun's probably going to be OK. Uh, it's got great PR. The recent sort of resurrection of it has been good. But uh, Ripper and Propeller need their due. So Twitter is great, but the Flying uh, the Facebook uh, has been some interesting interaction here about the spelling mistakes, um, comments from Peter Hoffman from the Terraways, uh, rubbishing one of the Rip It Up rumours, and Dean unfortunately didn't find fame and fortune when he left the Terraways, which was a shame. Um, but this is obviously sort of hitting a chord, and sorry, Simon, I'm putting you on <laughs> which is quite nice. Um, so as a memory institution, what can you do? Uh, maybe the question isn't what you can do, but what should you be doing? Because there is, after all, a mandate for this, or specifically in one piece of, of legislation. Um, institutions, specifically government kind of ones, are generally too slow and risk averse and lack the resources to do justice to all of the broad range of materials out there, let alone to focus on music. There's a couple of things that always seem to get in the way. From the outside, it appears to me that there's also a lack of prioritisation around audio material. This work is hard, it's time consuming, and it's expensive. But when I look at digitisation programmes, I see no real focus on much aside from old newspapers and photographs. This, of course, is informed by the copyright issue. Old stuff's simply easier to get online. But it seems as though this has become the modus operandi, and maybe you're getting a little comfortable in just doing the same old thing. And it feels like no one wants to ask the hard questions to fight the battles, because pop culture doesn't really kind of get a look in. But I know it's hard, but it just seems like there are barriers being put up, or you're not caring. And it's too easy, I think, to hide behind the copyright issue, and it's too easy to shift the blame onto someone else. So the issue of copyright yeah, it looms over everything, and we can assume that it isn't going to be sorted soon. So, what can you do? It's another Morrissey, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, copyright will negate wide public access for a lot of things, but not all. I mean, are you out there talking to artists or record labels? Is there anyone asking for permission, or are you just assuming that the answer will be no? So you need to be targeting record labels and people like Simon here who have stacks of tapes stashed away, slowly oxidising. So these are unique documents of our culture and we need to be more proactive in seeking out these fragile items and preserving them. Hopefully any preservation kind of work going on right now is focusing on, on old recording tape um, and CDs, even early CDs, are at risk as well. And these are the format that need rescuing and it's basically a race against the past. So this highlights another issue. Um, I'm not going to read this slide out, but it's quite interesting. That article from Vox magazine um, is well worth a read. Yep. Um, it would be nice to see what's going on inside your institution. Um, I can't see policies, targets, progress. What are you doing? Now, let people know. There's some good information around on the National Library website and sound archives on care and preservation, but not a lot of information on actually what you're doing to preserve stuff and what you are preserving. So I'd like to see the current projects and programs demystified and publicised. But it's not just the music. Ephemera is just as vital in defining a culture. So posters, flyers, set lists, ticket stubs, live photos. The stuff's all over the net. Uh, from memory institutions, however, the pickings are kind of slim. There are archives of gig posters at the Turnbull and Christchurch City Libraries, for example. Christchurch have even got theirs up online, but there's not a lot around. Audio culture is your best bet from this stuff, um, but there's not enough out there and available. Quick check on the National Library site, 56 images available for the subject popular music. To Papa, 42, out of how many hundreds of thousands of online images? 
It's not enough. And I know there are hundreds of posters, for example, that could be up. So I was recently part of a Facebook discussion with David Swift, the former press journalist and drummer for 80s English band The Razor Cuts. He's got a whole swag of posters in his house taking up space. His solution? Donate them to an archive of gig posters, which was perfect. But where is this mythical institution? What really hit home, though, were his last comments. Does the library archive get exhibited regularly? So you can't just lock stuff away. If you're looking to participate in the culture and contribute, show the stuff you have. Use your exhibition spaces. They're being preserved, sure, but we're missing out on the access. So audio culture is doing a great job of making connections and tapping into crowdsourced resources. But is this happening at an institutional level? Harness the passion and dedication of institutional staff across the sector. Leverage the connections being forged by audio culture and actually collaborate. Look for sponsorship, even. I just thought I'd put this out there. Oh, just a second. Uh, <laughs> so this may be true, but there are so many points of interconnection between music fans and also a desire to help and be involved. Advertise what you're doing, be involved in communities, reach out, make links, collaborate, both with producers and across institutions. Your job is to ensure that as much material as possible is preserved and made available. Okay. Thank you. moment of tension Sorry. as we brush, brush, brush the DIY archivists off the stage to bring on the voice of the institution. Uh, so Sholto, um, after that publication uh, from who is a music, a born digital music art and web archivist at the National Library, outside the Tribal Library in the National Library. Thanks Sammy, kia ora everybody. Um, the National Library and the Turnbull Library have been collecting digital music for, hold on, get my slide up. Am I? Cool, start again. Um, we've been collecting digital music since about 2008 at the National Library and the Turnbull Library, so I thought I'd do a brief overview and I'll emphasise brief on uh, some of the content we've been collecting in this area. Also uh, some of the successes we've had and finish up with some of the key challenges that we're facing in digital music archiving. So as far as uh, what types of music we're collecting online, um, basically any music that's pr produced within New Zealand or where there's a creative contribution by New Zealanders who are based both in New Zealand and overseas is in scope for our collecting. Obviously though this casts quite a wide net and due to limited resources as well as technical and legal restraints um, our main aim is to collect a representative sample of the type of content uh, that's been produced online by New Zealand musicians and that's just a range of the musicians from all over the globe just to highlight the range of content we're collecting. If you can name them all, I'll be impressed. Uh, we started selecting and archiving music websites in 2008 as re part of our regular selective web harvesting program. And since that period, we've managed to select and archive over 1,000 sites. Uh, most of these are then re-harvested on an annual basis to keep up with changing content. And also significantly, uh, about 20% of these websites are no longer online. Uh, this to me highlights the ephemeral nature of this type of content and also suggests the value of this collection for future research purposes. We've been archiving digital music since 2009. Initially our main focus was on collecting full length albums but now we've also diversified into collecting EPs, singles, remixes, mixtapes, uh, and any other content that uh, comes online, we have a good look at and decide whether we can collect it. Uh, we've selected and archived about 5,000 items to date across a wide range of music genres, and the content that we tend to prioritise is any content that doesn't have a physical equivalent, so it's not released also on vinyl or tape or CD and any limited edition or more ephemeral content that appears to be at a high risk of loss online. 
Online music videos is an area we're still cutting our teeth on. Uh, we started looking at these in 2013 and have archived probably about 300. Um, it's fair to say there's a lot more technical and legal issues around collecting this kind of material and that's something we're currently working through. Uh, but also because there's such a lot of content being produced on platforms like YouTube and Vimeo for example, we've decided to um, collect certain subject areas and just focus on them and these include live music, festival footage, music documentaries and interviews and also tour related videos. So as far as the mechanisms or avenues we have for collecting digital music, uh, in 2006 the legal deposit uh, extended to, to include electronic published documents which helped pave the way for us collecting digital music online and this now forms the bulk of our collecting practices about 70%. Uh, another 20% is on a permissions based process which I'll outline shortly and another 10% is coming in through Creative Commons licensed material. So for that, that content that's out of scope for legal deposit, uh, a lot of this content's produced overseas. Uh, we currently have a permissions process where we get directly in contact with the copyright holders and encourage them to fill in our online permissions form, which you can see up there. And a part of this is them selecting also the level of access that they'd like us to have on their music. Um, currently there's only two options of restricted access, meaning that the music can only be streamed from within the library reading rooms, or the other extreme is open access where any of the music can be streamed directly from our online catalogue. And we're also looking at re redesigning these permissions forms at the moment and looking at possibly adding Creative Commons license options into this. Uh, the permissions process can be quite involved, there's a lot of non-response and a lot of backwards and forwards negotiations with labels and producers. Um, but despite this, we've had relative success in signing up 40 labels and just over 300 independent bands and artists. The third mechanism I mentioned was Creative Commons, which forms about 10% of the music in our collection. This is something we're really keen to see increase, and um, it does seem to be on the increase, which is good. Uh, it makes it a lot easier for us to collect, and also when it comes to access, it's a lot easier to have the clear guidelines of use and reuse for this content. And that's just an example of one of the ways that we're promoting our Creative Commons music through our annual Turnbull Library mixtape. So just to finish up on some of the key challenges that might get us thinking for the panel discussion, um, as I mentioned, it's, uh, it's difficult to determine what's in scope for legal deposit. This is due to the global nature of the music industry where music's produced in a wide range of countries and on different platforms, which blurs the lines of what content's in scope for legal deposit and what we need permission for. It's often difficult for us to determine who copyright holders of content are when seeking permissions and getting in touch with them. I mentioned there's a high non-response rate and also there's a relative uh, amount of uh, producers who are unaware who actually owns the copyright to the music they're put out there, which obviously makes it difficult for us. Um, a lot of music's now distributed on overseas platforms, uh, Bandcamp's a good example of this, and this tends to be governed by their terms and conditions and also foreign copyright laws, which we need to get our heads around and try and respect. A lot of New Zealand, uh, some distributors like Amazon don't allow digital music distribution outside of their geographical regions, which makes it difficult for us collecting this content. Last one. And uh, as far as websites go, they're becoming more complex and difficult to harvest. There's a lot more third party embedded content and things that our harvester can't pick up. Uh, it's also noticeable that a lot more bands and musicians are moving to social media as their main online presence, uh, which leads into should or can we be archiving social media accounts such as SoundCloud, Facebook and Last.fm. There's technical and legal questions around this. And also just a general question of how do we promote the value of our music collection in an environment where music's readily accessible online from multiple platforms. Uh, Spotify is a good example of this. So thanks for listening. And our final panelist is the return of Upper Punks. 
Um, so more DIY music archiving um, around a uh, particular community and uh, geographic region. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Okay. Introductory music. Off you go. That's all good. Um, yeah, I, I guess I won't go over too much about what uh, I talked about yesterday with Up The Punks. Um, what I'd like to sort of talk about was where I was heading towards the end of the talk yesterday. And as you all know, the Up The Punks project is a DIY collaborative community project archiving stuff within the Wellington punk scene. Um, it has been operating since 2001. I think the first exhibition was 2002. Um, it digitized in 2011, we started migrating online. and. It sort of focuses is, is very much on the contemporary um, punk scene and trying to re draw relations between that and the archive. So we're kind of anti-nostalgia very much. Um, we're interested in the history of things, obviously, but I get a bit tired of um, old punks talking about what it was like back in the day. Um, so the engagement is very much in the contemporary scene and creating collaborative um, spaces and interactions with people um, and who are producing the music and the gigs and, and all that sort of stuff. Can I get this to go? So, I mean, this is just an example of where, in the last year, um, things have been heading. Uh, these kind of collaborative movie, um, Up the Punks television episodes and things like that. Um, an exhibition in 2000 and... Um, Kill the volume. Yeah, so basically it's, it's about, um, you know, basically interpreting, I suppose, the, uh, the messages and, and, and stuff in the visual um, aesthetic of, of each of these individual bands have become quite collaborative in how they're scripted and the, the look at the, of them and, you know, they're kind of uh, gaggy and, and topical um, and fun to produce and are a new sort of direction in which we're heading in terms of uh, producing scene sort of run up so we've just done a big um, five episode look at a, a band tour through the South Island that's online now and um, a, a look at the Christchurch Punk Fest which happened in October um, as a kind of a, an hour long episode that sort of just summarizes a little stuff and then um, obviously goes into the archive and will be reproduced and reformatted for different uses further down the line. So, um, yeah. That's enough for me. Thank you. Okay, so I think what we'll do now for the about 25 minutes we've got for the panel discussion session, um, I'll kick things off with a question and then uh, see if you guys have any questions that you'd like to ask yourselves or the audience and then we'll start sending the mic out into the audience for questions and comments uh, from you guys as well. Um, so my starter question is I think uh, perhaps there's quite a few different definitions of archives at the table. Um, so uh, my question would be, you know, when you think of a music archive, what are you thinking of? Uh, where do you see your projects and the, the content that you're generating? Um, you know, kind of years slash decades into the future. So if we start with perhaps the most formal archive and go from there. <laughs> right, no pressure then. Uh, Yours is there for perpetuity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the big part of what our archive means is that it's, a, it's preservation focused. So anything that's going into our archive is, is technically going to be there forever. Um, we have a, a really good preservation program that um, keeps uh, everything running and all the formats stable and migrated if necessary. Uh, but another thing about an archive is there's no point having an archive if it's not accessible and that is a key thing that we need to work on at the moment is, is making the music in our archives a lot more accessible to the public and also I think for us to work a lot more with it the DIY type archives and share content a bit more and make it more available. 
Um, I could adapt my No Two record collections to the same, so the No Two archives are the same. Um, my, I don't consider what I do an archiving project per se in the kind of traditional archives kind of thing. Um, I just wanted to get this out there before it kind of got lost, um, and hopefully it sticks around. Um, yeah, <laughs> in an ideal world, someone would be doing this and uh, archiving it properly and having OCR and you know, or fully searchable and everything else. But um, yeah, it's quite really into my mind about what's going to happen in 10 years because I wasn't expecting it to last much more than in a few weeks <laughs> when it started. So. The word archive is a funny one. We used to try to consciously distance ourselves from the word archive when we were talking audio culture for a variety of reasons, um, some political and some just because it was a little bit scary. Uh, we're not trying, I don't think consciously, to say here we are archiving stuff. We're trying to tell the stories and preserve the stories. But as the process has continued, we've started to become an archive of things like photographs, for example. We've got 15,000 photographs of New Zealand musicians and music, New Zealand music scenes and things now on various hard drives, so that in itself forms an archive. The uh, thing I mentioned before about context means that it's onwardly going all the time, so the word archive tends to make, for a lot of people, it's like a, a dusty box you put things into. We don't want to do that. We want to be something that's alive and continuing. As to we, how we continue, I suppose it's down to whether the money keeps on coming in from the funders, and so far they have, and um, hopefully we'll get to a stage where we're big enough for the county to switch off, but yeah. Are you concerned at all about, um, with your practice of embedding material from around the internet, um, how stable those, the, that, that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, YouTube is something we embed on, and we have an ongoing process of checking every single page on our site because stuff disappears quite quickly. Even official things like, for example, Flying Nun has started pulling down some of their old videos putting better versions of their videos up, so we have to actually go through and swap the videos out. So it's um, it's something you have to be very conscious of, and especially with some of the slightly more rogue stuff like SoundCloud and things, that people close their accounts and it's gone. The, um, we don't <coughs> embed photographs and stuff, they're all hosted by us, but yeah, it is a problem, it's an ongoing issue, which we don't necessarily have the funds to address all the time, but Yeah, in terms of the Outlet Punks archive and where we see ourselves, um, it's pretty much kind of like a shared collective um, record collection slash photo album slash um, you know, storybook, I suppose, of um, various generations throughout Wellington Punk scene. Um, I'd like to say we have a really cohesive structure involved in organising and collecting everything, but um, it's pretty much kind of ad hoc at the moment. It's not to sort of address. Um, I know as a music librarian at a mainly analog uh, collection um, in Dunedin, um, where would you see that material <coughs> actually going? I know I would, I would be asking kindly if any material that you collected, if you would consider putting it with us, uh, rather than um, on a hard drive or in, in a dusty collection somewhere. Well, it's working. There's, um, there's no intention of just putting it onto a hard drive and forgetting about it. The whole point of what we've got is taking it out there, what we get once we've probably curated it a little bit and um, filtered and do what we have to do to, to um, share it uh, and checking rights and that sort of stuff is to make sure it's all available. That's the whole point of what we're doing with the, the, um, the reach out of the community. If we don't share it with people, what's the point? So, yeah. And in terms of the um, analog materials that you're getting in, well, there's a, what um, Simon was talking before, or Simon was talking before about um, storage and stuff, and there's so much stuff out there, posters and you know, all ephemera, all thousands of different kinds of things, t-shirts, etc. 
there is a move afoot and to record a music museum right now to have some sort of broad storage facility where these things can be stored properly and maybe at some stage in the future do a, I don't know, not a Hall of Fame, but a New Zealand music exhibition of some sort, whether it's permanent or whether it's um, travelling or whatever, I don't know. These are all just rough ideas right now. But it kind of has to be done. And a lot of the things that we're finding, we can we can scan posters and we can scan badges and all that sort of thing, but to see the physical item is quite a different thing. So if, if we can work with the museums and the libraries and take things out and show it to people, that's fun. Um, and in terms of you were trying to establish regional um, relationships with regional institutions, can you see a situation where you get materials coming in and then you <coughs> find the kind of appropriate place to house them? Sure, sure. But we're, it's very early days right now. Cool. I mean, that's what I was trying to get at a little bit about the more collaboration between institutions and sharing of stuff. I mean, if these, if these are digital things, then matter where they are but they can be linked to where they need to be. and it's just joining up the institutions uh, and getting that done. Yeah. Um, question is sort of how much is there and how much access do you think we could do without causing people to get mad? So make it more concrete, we'll store everything for free if you, if you want to put it up on the net. Um, so that, you know, petabytes, gigabits per second, free, do it. Um, well, we found that the a CD, if you do it really, really well, it takes about 15 minutes, to, and it's mostly digitizing all the artwork and stuff. Uh, an LP or a cassette tape, as including chopping it up into pieces and making it to ID3 tags, about an hour if you, if you do it. But what's the scale of the New Zealand challenge in terms of how many LPs do you think of is in your purview and how many say CDs? And of course there's the band camps and YouTubes and things. Um, but if we just take those two, what's the scope of it? And if we were to put it up, can we make what percentage do you think we could put up streaming, you know, as opposed to say thirty seconds or something? Um, and, and and not make people uh, you know launch lawyers. I don't know the size of the scale, but um, you'd probably get We've got two record companies left in the world now. Major ones would get pretty, pretty annoyed quite quickly. But um, do you know an idea of how big? I don't know exactly how many records there are, but up until the probably about 1980, we didn't produce that many records in New Zealand. New Zealand artists I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the, the, the Beatles or the Rolling Stones. But we had a couple of major indies and a, a few big companies releasing records. Most of the big companies didn't release that much. So it wasn't, you're really looking at 1980 onwards when it kind of exploded. In terms of numbers, I have no idea whatsoever. What is interesting in New Zealand as compared to the rest of the world is that the large part of the music industry is independent. It always has been independent. The record labels, the big ones, do record stuff, of course. But I mean, right now, I'd say, and this is like off the top of my head, 80% of the music that comes out of New Zealand is released by small record companies. So. The pathway towards doing that might be a lot easier than it would be in a lot of countries where the majors control things. So you might be able to just do it all. Maybe, but I mean the majors are another issue all to get there to deal with them. Yeah, they launch lawyers. Yeah. And maybe Shofu, could you speak to the, the scale of um, what we might call self-published born digital museum music? Yeah, uh, a big part of what we're collecting is uh, independent music on uh, platforms like Bandcamp, for example. Um, we collect a lot of um, early demos and things like that that are sort of published online quite quickly and disappear. And I'd say uh, at the moment we're archiving just over a, a thousand albums a year um, and not really, um, I'd say that we're collecting probably about half of what's coming out in that area, at a guess. Um, but it's just getting bigger and bigger, uh, and um, platforms like Bandcamp and uh, SoundCloud and things like that, because they're not actually based in New Zealand, they don't fall under our legal deposit law, so that makes it yeah, another conversation to have on whether, whether we can be collecting that content and then making it accessible. So, yeah, the scale is, quite, is growing, um, especially in the um, if we set aside uh, the terms and conditions uh, issue, 
um, to clarify for a legal deposit uh, mandate um, if uh, publishers and uh, producers of music are making their music available freely then we can do the same uh, through our um, archive if they're restricting it then we have to keep it restricted currently so that's a piece of the puzzle the same um, with CDs and LPs uh, we're not currently digitizing CDs and LPs as they come into the collection. Is there anyone here who can speak to the Archive of New Zealand Music and their physical collections here? It's pretty much uh, on demand and if I've got copyright clearance then, then we'll so start it. It's kind of it's kind of an on demand thing. If they have copyright clearance, um, then we'll do we'll, we'll copy CDs and lot of things. I know that I've got the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was just thinking about sort of uh, information distribution into the future, and I guess this goes beyond just music. This is probably books and films and stuff as well. And sort of looking at the models that, that are emerging now, like Spotify or Netflix or whatever the is it Kindle. And what do you think? This may be one for Shelter to answer first, but it's more generally a wider question for anyone who's interested. Is what do you think that the future of archives might be? when uh, there's not only not a physical copy, but not a downloadable copy either. Everything's sort of subscription access and controlled by, uh, as it is now, maybe a, a, a multinational corporation or whatever it might be in the future. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because that's something I think about quite a bit too. Um, there is a definite move to music shifting to streaming and uh, less downloading. Um, and Spotify has definitely made a big difference there. Uh, also, Bandcamp uh, shortly releasing a new subscription service uh, where individual bands and artists can create their own subscription within the site um, and set their own fees. Um, so, this is technically going to lead to less people actually downloading discrete albums and, and units and you know just streaming totally. So. Uh, it does concern me how we're going to go about collecting when there's not a, uh, a physical unit or an album as such to collect on and that's all just a streaming um, content. Um, there are ways I guess it may move more into what we do with our web harvesting. Although having said that, <laughs> collecting streaming music on music websites is extremely difficult. Um, so. Yeah, I don't really have a good answer for how we're going to deal with it, but it's definitely coming and I think that it's something we need to be aware of and look at technical ways that we can do this. I mean, it's also going to affect the way we describe content and our cataloging records and yeah, everything. So it's, um, yeah, times are changing. Well, Bruce, how are you dealing with that stuff that the internet are quite with you? Do you have any leads? Um, in terms of the amount or, or um, um, well, but are you are you archiving all of the streams and everything else? How are you? How yeah, are we're you trying. Um, uh, with YouTube, we we uh, we archive anything from YouTube that's been mentioned on Twitter, and it's about two or three terabytes a day. So I don't know. We've got fifty to hundred million YouTube things, but that's sort of our way of doing selecting of YouTube. Um, I'm not sure what we're doing with Bandcamp and SoundCloud. Um, so I bet we're not doing much very well there. Um, there's um, a lot is distributed through BitTorrent, um, and we're archiving that. Um, so then there's the question of how, what can we do to try to make that accessible again, um, in some way. So that's 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 a little tricky. Um, we're still trying to figure that out. Listening rooms. Um, uh, we, we'd like to do short clips at least, and, and we're doing a lot to try to match them to things like YouTube, Amazon, Spotify, so people can get a satisfying experience. Um, all 78 seem to be free game. Um, uh, LPs, I, I don't know, maybe there might be a line such that if things never made it onto CD, you know, and, and they were from the sort of LP era, sort of from the 80s or before something, um, that that might be okay. But we're, we're still just starting, starting in on, on this. But I think you're doing the right thing, which is work within the communities. 
So it doesn't feel like it's somebody else coming from outside, you know, some multinational corporation or even some big bad library, right? You know, somebody, <laughs> hey, they've got a lot of money. Why, why aren't, you know, I, I suffered from my music. Why are they, whatever. Um, but sort of work within the communities to see if you can find something that makes sense within them um, to go and not only preserve the stuff, but make it accessible. Um, so we're, we're in early stages on music. And we'd love to work with you guys. Oh, uh, we have about 600 terabytes. We've just got a question back here. I've actually forgotten my question. Um, but, um, uh, uh, yeah, that's the plan. Um, actually, uh, but before my question, I've got some observations. Um, uh, I've got, a, I, you know, I've got a public library card, and that means that I can get things at home that the library's paid for. It seems pretty weird that I can't get a National Library reading room card that I can use in my living room and my bedroom. So that's a challenge. Uh, trivial, you know. Just I've just got to fly to Molesworth Street. Um, can you fix that? Uh, and an observation, 1,500 photos on a hard drive without any context is not really acceptable. 1,500 photos on the web without any context is cool. So we've got to fix that as well, you know. Context is overrated. Um, so that comes to my question. I think overlooking digital music distribution, which is, you know, um, a problem, a challenge, and a lot of it's not very good. Um, and, but that's for our children to work out. But um, I think there's a real problem that we don't actually know the quantum of the published New Zealand output. We don't know, it seems, how many records, CDs, cassettes, 78s have been published. We don't have a pie chart to tell us how many of those have been digitised. We don't know how many are in the National Bibliography. There's a real problem. I hear rumours that there's notebooks in the National Library's basement, but you know, the real problem is, how big is this problem? We don't know that. And if, if, if it's not very big, you know, there's collections around the country, but we don't actually know how big the problem is. Does anyone in the panel or the audience want to speak to that? Um, to be fair, I think that Recorded Music New Zealand have got a list of every record ever released in New Zealand. They've actually worked that out. Is that on the web? Not yet, but it should be. It should be. There's, a, also, there's also a book um, called Just for the Record, which lists every New Zealand vinyl release up in the um, It should be, and it will be. It's, it's currently, be, it's currently being reworked at the moment and about to go online. So, yeah, that list does exist. The other thing that I thought I'd go back to before with the previous um, question was the thing we're losing with streaming, especially streaming um, legacy releases is the artwork. Now, one of the things that I think that the Internet Archive is doing is capturing the artwork as you go through and digitise things. But when you look at something, on, if it's gone straight to Spotify, some long lost album is put on Spotify, the artwork is lost forever. And the artwork is a big part of what the record actually is, especially in the, the days of LPs and for a lot of CDs as well. So it's fine to have the music there, it's fantastic to have the music available, but they have the whole sort of throw that word at the end, the context of what it, how it arrived to us is gone. So that's something that scares me a little bit. Uh, kia ora. Um, I'd like to applaud the initiatives um, you guys are all involved with. As a um, music engineer and producer of some of your stuff, I um, think it's great and it's really good to see. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I'd just use a couple of my bits of some items I have as case study perhaps, uh, I want to allude to the sense of competition I feel around some of the archives, like if I have a some live cassettes of stuff I mixed, um, who do I give it to? How do I trust that um, on behalf of the band who actually have the property right perhaps, or the record companies that sign them up, you know? So I just, I, I think this is a seed for some other discussions to be had. Um, between the archives, how 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 best to um, service, which is what I was hearing from Simon. <laughs> um, you know how how to really um, collectively come up with solutions for everybody to work in their own little pockets, but also to be collectively, you know, saving labour, not 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 going to two different places, 
that sort of thing. So, for example, so I have live tapes, I have, say, test pressings, might be quite collectible of um, stuff because we used to be really sensitive about that when we, when we um, produced records. There was only one, one pressing plant. We had to fly down to Wellington and we had to really coax the engineer who would bugger off for a cup of tea at 10.30 to do his best job that sort of thing um, you know so I mean I'm keen to sort of find out a little bit of a where someone like me can deposit stuff and I trust you all but I clearly want it for the best results a bit like the one who said well, um, you know I can give it give these posters but is there going to be access I know everybody's thinking it but I'd just like to think that there's pretty soon there's some collaborative discussions around that area thanks <coughs> Any comments on that? I agree with it, yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree as well that uh, there isn't as much coordination as there should be between the different yeah. people and our um, We all have different things we can offer. Um, obviously, the National Library and the Terminal Library are experts in preserving content. Uh, it's a big part of what we do, and that's uh, within our mandate. So a lot of what you're talking about, I'm sure that we'd be happy to receive that type of content. Um, having said that, we don't want to be a, a bully organisation where we're preventing content from going other places. Um, me personally, I, my main concern is that it's preserved indefinitely and that it's available to as many people as possible. So however we can work away to you know, we'll work together and make sure that Content's being unearthed and it's being made available to the public and it's being preserved. It's got to be a good thing. So, yeah, I agree. Right, I'm going to take a presenter's privilege for the last question before we wrap up for lunch. Uh, I don't think we really got into um, some issues around uh, that um, Simon brought up in your talk yesterday around kind of actively ignoring copyright issues and the tension that places on the relationship between DIY projects and institutions, but we might have to leave that because the question I want to ask is around probably these two outside uh, speakers and the idea of community. So um, how you find, uh, Simon, perhaps how community engagement has built around your culture and John, um, your project's been going a lot longer. Um, what you've noticed about uh, community engagement over the depth and time and also uh, what elements of music community can we also be trying to collect and preserve and make accessible beyond music and artwork? Well from day one with audio culture we've always wanted to engage the community obviously it's, it's a crucial part of what we're doing and it's the um, what's well, central of what we're doing and it's all very well for us to put the site up online and say there we go but unless we get people coming back to us and inter interacting and engaging with the site, it's kind of pointless. So social media is obviously been a big part. Our Facebook page has been very important, our Twitter feed. But the Facebook page in particular has been quite interesting because a lot of the older musicians and the younger musicians and people who went to the gigs and whatever have all started commenting and leaving stuff there. And we realised very, very early on we wanted to capture that because those experiences are as, as important as the um, record covers and important as anything else we put up there. So one of the reasons we're moving towards this recollect software right now is to try and uh, we harvest some of that stuff so we can keep it forever. Um, for example, when my sets played in Wellington in 1980 with Rob Muldoon, we put a picture of Rob Muldoon with my sets up. The guy who was with Rob Muldoon wrote Rob Muldoon's experiences and what he thought and posted on our Facebook page. So we had to find a way of extracting that and putting it into the, the larger story. And it's been a, a kind of tricky process, and the obvious issues you have about leaving on Facebook is somehow Facebook has some sort of proprietorial sort of claim to it, and we don't want that. We want to make sure it belongs to the people of the community for what we're working. And uh, it's yeah, it was important to us to capture that. It's, it's where we're going. Yeah, in terms of the Up the Punks project, um, it's obviously a lot more focused um, geographically through a sort of 35 year history of uh, the ongoing ones and punch scene. So there's an audience engagement that's going on in the contemporary scene and then these successive generations, um, social media has become obviously integral and in, in getting a lot of that material 
out there and people commenting on it, uh, there's been a lot of, I suppose, um, things to be concerned about in terms of pulling stuff from people's um, physical photo albums that we have consent to put up and the kind of commentary and discussion that goes on and, and being aware of, um, you know, people can be a bit nasty online, things like that, and not wanting to, um, you know, dissuade further uh, discussion or contributions to the archive. Um, in terms of also not wanting to diss the National Libraries, but a lot of the uh, reason why um, Dr. Punks decided to go uh, digital online a few years ago was that the material was submitted into the uh, National Library archives after the 2003 exhibition, but it just basically disappeared into a research box somewhere in the archives there. Um, so again, there was this impetus to kind of make it um, a little more accessible again as a DIY project. All right, um, so that takes us to lunch. Thank you to all our panelists and the audience who participated. I'm sure if you've got any questions or follow-ups, uh, all our panel members are friendly and approachable in lunch and the afternoon sessions if they're sticking around. Uh, use the, the, the social media back channels as well and if you um, feel like there's anyone that you want to connect with out of this conversation, you can't find them, then um, try and find me and I'll see if I can help you out as well. So let's get the, the conversation continuing and connecting.